And without further ado, I am going to introduce Professor Laura Hines and Professor Elizabeth Weeks. Um, we're going to start off the conference with a bit of an introduction. So I have the pleasure of being colleagues with Professor Laura Hines. She teaches civil procedure, complex litigation, and remedies. Her scholarship examines the intersection of procedure and tort law with a particular focus on aggregate litigation. Hines' articles have appeared in the George Washington Law Review, Emory Law Journal, Wake Forest Law Review, India Law, Indiana Law Review, and other leading publications. She currently is the director of the Shook Hardy and Bacon Center for Excellence and Advocacy. Before joining KU, Hines is a litigation associate with Washington, D.C. offices of Order, and she clerked for Chief Justice Donald E. Lay of the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit. She's a graduate of Brown University and the University of Michigan Law School, where she served as a note editor on the Michigan Law Review. Joining her for the introductory remarks today is Professor Elizabeth Weeks. Um, Professor Weeks is Associate Dean for Faculty Development and the J. Alton Hoche Professor of Law at the University of Georgia. Uh, she joined the University of Georgia School of Law faculty in 2011. She presently serves as the school associate dean, and her teaching and research interests include torts, health law, healthcare financing and regulation, and public health law. Prior to coming to the University of Georgia, she was a faculty member here at KU Law, so we're excited to have her back. During her time here at KU Law, she was honored with not one, but two important awards. First, the Emil Award for Teaching, and also the Docking Faculty Scholar Award, which is a university-wide honor for faculty who have distinguished themselves early in their careers. Um, additionally, she served as a visiting professor at other law schools. Her scholarship includes the book, Healthism, Health Status, Discrimination, and the Law, which is a Cambridge University Press publication, um, and the health law textbook, The Law of American Healthcare, with um, Hubberfield Oderson, which is now in its second edition. Um, she has also published numerous articles, including pieces in the Georgia Law Review, the Boston University Law Review, the Hofstra Law Review, the University of Pennsylvania Journal on Constitutional Law, and the Washington University Law Review, and the North Carolina Law Review. Um, she was recognized as one of four emerging health law scholars nationwide by the American Society of Law, Medicine, and Ethics with its Health Law Scholars Award in 2005. Before joining the Academy, uh, she worked as an associate in the health industry group at Vincent and Elkins in Houston, and she also served as a judicial clerk for Judge Weiner of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit and Chief Justice Thomas Phillips of the she earned her bachelor's degree from Columbia University and her law degree from the University of Georgia. And she, while there, was on the Justice Report team, the editor in chief of the Georgia Law Review, and inducted into the Court of Appeals. I don't know quite how she went to class this week. <laughs> um, and so, uh, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Professor Hines and Professor Weeks, who will kick us off. Um, was, a, was a godsend, and she managed to um, 
uh, lure um, uh, several of the speakers that we um, have here today from um, these uh, tremendous law schools that I'll be telling you about um, a little bit later. Um, but I mostly wanted to thank uh, her um, personally for really being, it's sort of like she's uh, an emeritus or something um, of the law school and was able to um, really uh, uh, spearhead this effort to get this um, amazing group of scholars together. Um, she's going to talk a little bit uh, from uh, uh, the, the, uh, the get-go about the overall picture of the opioid epidemic. I'm sure that you know, we all see the headlines. It seems every day there's sort of new terrible news um, about the opioid epidemic and all the ways it affects um, every aspect of society. She's going to give us sort of that, that sort of background, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the legal perspectives um, that we will be hearing throughout uh, the rest of the day. Great, thank you. Um, so thank you all again um, for having us here and, and Laura for organizing, Elizabeth for being here, and Erica for organizing, and, and Dean Lassa, who's not here today, but also for um, hosting this event. It's really a delight to be back here. And a double homecoming with my former KU colleagues and friends, but also with my health law um, cohort who are well represented. Um, so as Laura mentioned, when she contacted me last spring saying that Erica and the student editors were interested in doing a health law topic, I, I rather quickly, without a lot of hesitation, said opioids, we do opioids. <laughs> and the topic was of personal, personal interest to me, particularly last spring, I was working in a, a fellowship with an outreach division of the University of Georgia called the Carl Vinson Institute of Government. And the University of Georgia, like KU, as a public university, has a service mission to the state. The Institute of Government provides more or less ad extension type services, but for local governmental units. And in working with them, I was focused on rural health issues in Georgia. And one can't get very far in rural health without hitting upon opioids. The topic touches on virtually every physician, primary care shortages, um, maternity deserts, hospital closures, broadband as a strategy to address mental health shortages, distance to detox and treatment centers. All of these issues um, percolate throughout the opioid crisis. And one of the unique characteristics of the crisis is that it does have this rural Appalachian heartland of America origin, and that's quite distinct from some other prior drug um, issues, crack cocaine, meth, heroin, which begin in inner cities and then percolated out to rural communities. In this case, rural communities are, are ground zero, so this is certainly an important topic, especially for states like Kansas and Georgia that are significantly rural. This um, slide will be familiar to my health law colleagues. Um, so this is a study, um, Princeton economist Ann Case and Angus Deaton in 2015 and subsequently in 2017, um, tracked these statistics on um, mortality rates. And what their studies revealed was a surprising increase in mortality among middle-aged white non-Hispanic adults with high school or less education. And this, they noted that this was this was significant because it was in contrast to declining mortality rates among other groups, and which is not to say that the other groups were necessarily doing well, but they were not doing worse um, than um, in previous years. And according to Case and Deaton, this mortality decline, they noted that the, there were mortality declines from the two biggest killers in middle age, cancer and heart disease, but marked increases in mortality related to drug overdoses suicide, and alcohol-related liver mortality. And they coined the term despair deaths, or de diseases of despair, to describe this constellation of conditions that are um, causing the increased mortality. They further noted, in addition to that, that middle-aged whites were also having increased morbidity. They were, they were sicker um, in various ways. And their conclusion, which there's a lot of controversy about the case in Deaton's study, but their conclusion was that it, this trend was at least partially attributable to increased opioid use, an epidemic of pain and suicide and overdose, particularly as this group of Americans faced worse economic security. For the first time, this was a generation of, of middle-aged white adults who were doing worse than their parents' generation, and they were in some sense losing their foothold in the American heartland. And this, again, effect was especially pronounced in rural areas that faced losses of manufacturing, resource extraction, um, agricultural jobs, and had difficulty attracting new employers or retaining skilled workers as skilled workers tended to migrate to urban areas. 
As I mentioned, to be sure, Case and Deaton's study is controversial. For one, they are criticized for perhaps overemphasizing this relatively modest increase in adversity that non-Hispanic whites were facing, while, again, other groups, blacks and other um, communities, have long and continue to suffer from premature death from all causes. And this emphasis in their study on the increased mortality for whites, it is also part of the opioid story in that much of the emphasis and the framing of this epidemic, framing it as a public health epidemic rather than a war on drugs, makes it, it's, it maybe has gotten more attention because of who it's affecting, because it is affecting white populations. Whereas prior drug crises affected people of color, they were perpetrators, they were not victims, as we are seeing in the opioid crisis. So accepting that opioids are not limited to rural areas now, by any means. That, that is where the crisis started. Um, places like Ohio, where Micah is, West Virginia, these were ground zero. These were the, it, it, where it continues to be particularly significant. So just one example of the scope of the problem, data from, the, from West Virginia, a largely rural state. Um, I'm going to describe some statewide data. This slide shows at least just one city. But statewide in West Virginia, between 2007 and 2012, the pharmaceutical industry shipped more than 780 million <coughs> opioid tablets into the state, which amounts to about 433 pills per person, which would be enough to medicate all 1.8 million residents in the state continuously for seven months. And this slide is just one town, the town of Mount Bay Shamrock, which has just one pharmacy. You can see the total pills per person is close to 10,000. So West Virginia continues, does, um, to suffer from one of the highest mortality rate from opioid overdoses in the country, and the numbers just continue to climb. So when Laura and I spoke, um, again, early last spring, the, the groundswell of the opioid litigation, which again is just one of the strategies and one of the issues on, on this topic that we'll be talking about today, but the litigation was just underway. Um, Professor Berman and I, after lunch, will be focusing on that particular topic. Cities and counties had filed lawsuits, states, tribes, and the federal government's statement of interest would come shortly. The MDL, the Multi-District Litigation in the Northern District of Ohio, had just been um, formed in December of 2017. And there were a host of legal and policy questions percolating, many of which our speakers will touch on today. And so I'll turn it back over to Laura to talk a little bit more about what you'll be hearing as the day progresses. Thank you. So uh, I was going to uh, do uh, sort of a, an overview of the uh, various uh, remedial approaches to deal with the opioid epidemic, and obviously we're not able to do all of um, what we could do um, with a, a two-week program, but in the snapshot that you're going to get today, we're trying to give you um, a, a good sense of the different ways that, um, that, the, um, that the legal community is, is trying to, to you know, attack and, and um, and, uh, and, and cope with this, um, this sort of what seems to be an intractable problem. Um, Congress, um, that is not known for being great solvers of large societal problems, <laughs> uh, nonetheless has, um, has just recently, just on Monday, the Senate voted 99 to 1 to pass um, a package called the um, OCRA, the Opioid Crisis Response Act of 2018, following up on a House package of, of similar measures um, that passed earlier this summer. Um, that, I think, is expected to get through um, on, a, on a bipartisan basis. Um, Mike Lee, I believe, was the one um, senator who said no, um, but I think he will not be enough to stop it. Um, and it, this, um, this package includes um, quite a bit of money for prevention and treatment programs, obviously um, of great need um, throughout the country. Um, a bunch of uh, uh, expenditures for NIH research into non-addictive alternatives to opioids. Um, uh, they instruct the FDA to create some regulations uh, surrounding the quantity of pills um, that doctors are allowed to um, prescribe. Um, they're going to um, increase the access um, to Medicaid mental health for people who are suffering from uh, opioid addiction. Um, they also have a, some provisions dealing with uh, some of the drug trafficking, the import of um, fentanyl, for, the, for instance, um, from China. Um, and apparently the U.S. Postal Service does not currently do much in the way of cargo um, uh, uh, checking. Um, and so a, a fair amount of drugs are able to come into the country through the U.S.
U.S. Postal Service um, because we don't have enough um, uh, inspectors, and so they're, they're instructing um, that, that's, that wing of enforcement. So it's sort of a multi-pronged um, approach, uh, but there is, in fact, some movement there, and again, in response to um, the, the outcries um, from so many sectors of our society. Uh, as Elizabeth mentioned, there is um, a lot of litigation. That's, that's my background, is um, complex litigation. And when I was in practice, um, one of the things that I worked on, in addition to the class action, the private class actions, I also worked um, in the tobacco world um, on what, what at the time were very novel suits brought by um, state attorneys general against the tobacco companies and trying to recoup Medicaid losses and other um, state losses from um, the, the, the tobacco um, addiction and, and all the um, increased health costs um, that went with it. Um, there's sort of a, a parallel um, sort of MDL litigation and obviously some, some local government um, and statewide litigation, I mean state brought litigation happening in courts all over the country right now. There's a lot of focus on the MDL um, in the Northern District of Ohio with Judge Polster, um, and he had a very ambitious plan to just smash some heads around and get that thing done. Um, and I, I gather that, that settlement has not actually um, uh, resulted yet. Um, so they are in the midst of discovery and they were talking about a trial, I think, in September of 2019. So and Professor Berman will be talking about that um, quite a bit more later, um, as will Professor Leeds, who um, has been involved on the Indian tribal side of that, and of course, Professor Weeks, who um, has a lot of experience with the local government side of that. So that litigation has um, a lot of uh, tentacles that, that reach into um, uh, a number of our speakers' um, uh, approaches and, and information about, about the, uh, the litigation. It is um, uh, litigation that is um, suing uh, pharmaceutical manufacturers, but also distributors and retailers, which complicates things. They have theories of fraud, <coughs> nuisance, failure to warn. Um, uh, Professor Berman, in addition to sort of giving us um, a, a, a nice primer on what's happening in that litigation, it, he's going to be addressing some of the really provocative and interesting questions. And again, it sort of parallels um, the tobacco litigation, which is what do you do with the money that you get? I mean, first of all, you can figure out what that money is, but assuming that you get a big settlement like what happened in the tobacco litigation, where's that money um, best allocated? Um, you know, the, for the most part, as I understand it, the tobacco monies have kind of just gone into state coffers, just state journal coffers, and they've gone to like highways and you know anything else the state wants to do. Um, uh, obviously, that is not the best way to really um, remediate some of the opioid concerns that the settlement is intended to, um, to address. And so, I think he's going to um, uh, raise some really interesting questions for us to think about in that regard. Um, there's also, you know, the criminal side, right? Uh, you know, as, as Professor Weeks mentioned. Um, in previous epidemics, the crack epidemic comes to mind. In the war on drugs that we saw in the 80s, you know there was there were mandatory minimum sentences, and you know uh, you know the sort of throwing all these DEA and, and enforcement resources at this, and treating this um, as um, as, a, as a criminal enterprise, weaponizing um, the war on drugs. Um, and as she said, you know in, in part because of racial makeup, and in part because opioids are in fact legal. Um, in many instances, it, it can't really be addressed in quite the same way, and it ought not to be, given our bad experience with war and drugs. Um, our missing speaker, actually, can you can we have the, uh, I forgot to do that. We had, um, this is our um, this is our speaker. Oh, we're oh, having the old one, sorry. Oh. You're supposed to be in Okay, so Jelani, forget this oh. one. Um, <laughs> actually, uh, uh, Professor Jelani Jefferson Exum, who is another um, one of the uh, KU uh, former professors who's um, left us for University of Toledo. She is going to be contributing, she couldn't be here today, but she's going to be contributing a piece to the symposium law review edition um, that gets into some of this, these criminal issues, right? The, the, the changing um, of, of, the, of our approach from uh, you know, uh, the, the, the defendants as, as criminals who need to be you know, put in jail, but rather thinking about um, how, to, uh, how to approach um, uh, people who, are, who have overdosed or who have, um, are, are found with you know, large amounts of, of drugs to try to treat them as people, you know, not necessarily victims, but people who are in need of help, um, people that we need to provide some um, uh, treatment services to and, and, and redirect our energies to trying to help them with their addiction rather than treating them as criminals and try to you know, jail, jail our way through the opioid um, epidemic. Um, also on the criminal side, um, we have uh, Professor Tovino, um, who's gonna be talking uh, about um, healthcare fraud and abuse laws 
she, um, I mean, obviously that is both, has both criminal and civil components to it, um, but she'll be touching on some of the criminal um, aspects as well. Um, and then we have um, you know, sort of the regular regulatory side, right? So what are the state regulatory agencies doing? What is the FDA doing? Um, I mentioned that, that in the legislation, there are some directives to the FDA, but the FDA has done some warnings, right? And then there's the DEA database trying to track um, these, those large numbers of pills um, that are going to these pharmacies. We're trying to get some, uh, at least transparency and information, and trying to get some um, regulatory approaches um, in, that, uh, in that regard. There's um, hospital accreditation and, of course, Medicaid uh, rules. Um, and a lot of those issues are going to be um, touched on uh, by uh, Professor Hodge and Professor um, Deneen. Professor Hodge is going to be talking about um, the inner relationship between um, marijuana and, um, and opioid uses, and that um, he'll, he'll do this in a moment, so I don't want to um, uh, I don't want to um, uh, give any spoilers. Um, but but talking about how um, uh, when we're talking about pain, you know, well, we have both marijuana and opioids, um, one of which is um, is legal but can be abused and get um, its users into um, you know, a, a, a train of heroin or illegal uses, then you have marijuana that is, in fact, illegal in many states, legal in some states. How do we sort of think about the interrelationship between those two, um, and what are some um, you know, good policies to think about going forward? Um, Professor Deneen is going to be talking, she's a former nurse, um, she comes to us from um, Creighton. She's going to be talking about um, developing you know, best practices and trying to sort of get some, some, some clear, defined, um, common views of what it means to um, to have um, harmful prescribing um, and uh, and how we can because there are there is such a disparate approach among the states to developing what those um, best practices are trying to sort of um, uh, uh, approach the the the, um, the question as um, you know the model code um, try to try to give state regulatory agencies and and perhaps um, uh, professional organizations some you know common language and some common um, standards for what is an appropriate amount of, um, of prescription. Um, so we have a really exciting and interesting um, set of speakers. And um, uh, I guess it's my turn to just introduce the first of them. Yeah? Um, yeah, I think that's it. So um, thank you all for coming. I'm really excited to see so many students and, and, uh, and members of the community here. Um, thank you so much to Professor Weeks. We'll be hearing much more from her later in the afternoon. Um, but I'm going to just sort of say thank you to her. Um, this morning, and for, um, for helping, as I said, really uh, be the, the spearhead in, in helping to organize this morning. So thank you very much.